Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending another AHS seminar series talk. So tonight we'll be having Sebastian Hofer. Sebastian has a Bachelor of Science from Freie Universität in Berlin. Um, and after he completed his Bachelor of Science, he came across here to Australia, where he then completed thesis research um, on the cognitive ability of lizards. Um, Sebastian now works over in the Bahamas, and in particular, he's working on uh, animal-born uh, cameras and drones for tracking sea turtles. Um, but tonight he'll be presenting some of his other research. And so that research is looking at um, the snakes of the Bahamas overall, in particular things like road mortality, population dynamics, and a few other factors like that. Seb's also running a community education program, which he'll be talking about tonight. Um, and it promises to be a really, really good talk. Um, so before I hand over to Seb to give his presentation, I'd just like to say thank you so much again for attending. Um, and please do ask lots of questions throughout the talk. So Seb will be on the chat line below. Um, where we'll be answering questions for you. And if you do find these talks interesting, let us know, because we really do like the support. And further to that, if you are a researcher who's watching these talks, definitely feel free to get in contact with us via the Facebook page or via our email, um, which is on our website, the AHS website. Um, and from there, we can then arrange a talk as well. Um, we're not only just looking for, for career researchers, we're also looking for students or people with interesting natural history observations as well. So if you think you've got something that's interesting, give us an email, give us a call and let us know. But other than that, I'll hand it over to Seb. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my snake research and conservation efforts in the Bahamas. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Today, I want to give you more of an overview without going into too much detail of the snake research project I developed in the Bahamas as an undergraduate researcher. A little bit about me and my background. I grew up in Germany, uh, more specifically in the southwest of Germany in a little village called Wackenheim, which is close to Frankfurt. And I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by beautiful forests, rivers and lakes uh, while growing up. You can see here's a picture of my backyard with a forest just adjacent to it. And beyond that fence, there is a small creek flowing down there. So I was fortunate to be able to step out of my house and essentially um, just roam through the forests and experience the wildlife that it had to offer. So I got fascinated with reptiles and amphibians from a really early age, and I was able to find and catch snakes and lizards, frogs and salamanders just outside of my backyard. And much to my to, to the pleasure of my mom, I'm sure, I brought back quite a few critters over the years. You can see me here bringing back some toads that I would have caught earlier. And this passion for uh, reptiles and amphibians only grew stronger over the years. And eventually I had um, my own pet reptiles. You can see here uh, the two bearded dragons that I had. And I guess that's also the first connection to Australia. And so eventually I graduated high school and I thought it would be a great idea to go to the land of the reptiles and travel across the world to do a work and holiday in Australia. And so I spent one year traveling all across Australia and seeing the amazing landscapes and, and nature as well as wildlife that Australia has to offer. And I really fell in love with this place. And I don't seem to be able to stay away for too long. <laughs> so after this, it took me a few years of traveling across Europe, including um, some work for Archelon, which is the Sea Turtle Protection Society in Greece, where we were always helping to protect the loggerhead sea turtles in the Mediterranean Sea. Before I started um, my undergrad in biology at the Freie Universität Berlin. The honors component of that degree actually brought me back to Australia and more specifically to the Lizard Lab at Macquarie University, where I, under the supervision of Martin Whiting and Birgit Schabo, investigated the cognitive abilities of some Australian skinks. We actually recently published the results of this project. So if you're interested in learning more about inhibitory control in Australian skinks, please check out the um, publication that I screenshotted here in the bottom right. And so after 
um, my degree, I got hired as a research assistant at the Cape Luther Institute. And you can see the institute here in the top left, or the grounds rather, um, with the actual institute in the top right, with some of the facilities below. And you might be wondering what or where even is Eleuthera. And that is totally fair because I certainly didn't before I got there. Uh, so Eleuthera is this 457 square kilometer island located in the eastern parts of the Great Bahama Bank in the Bahamas. And you can see Eleuthera here in the top right in that inside map, it's framed by this red rectangle. And as you can see by this satellite image, it's an extremely elongated island. So it's about 120 kilometers long north to south and in some areas only less than a kilometer wide. The highest elevation on Eleuthera is about 60 meters above sea level. And so the vegetation on Eleuthera is dominated by broad-leafed dry forest, which you can see here in the bottom right, with um, castorina trees, so Australian pines on the left, and mangroves found along the coasts. The Queen's Highway, which you can see on the left and the right here, is Eleuthera's only principal road, and it stretches almost the entire length of the island. So I got hired to help co-manage the Institute Sea Turtle Research Program that was developed by Dr. Nathan Robinson, who you can see here on the left, and also teach a research class to high school students that were spending a 100-day semester program at the Institute. And for the sea turtle research, we were monitoring the local sea turtle populations by looking at their growth rates, population dynamics, movements, and habitat use. And for that, we went out in, in these little boats on these beautiful mangrove creeks and found some, whenever we found a turtle, we would catch it and bring it on the boat and then measure it and, and weigh it and everything, and then give it a, um, a unique metal identifier, so metal tag, so that when we would catch another turtle and it would have one of those tags, we would um, know it's the same one. In order to investigate habitat use, we were using what we called turtle cams. So you can see turtle cam here in this picture on the left. Essentially, they're dive cameras that are attached to a turtle's carapace by using epoxy and galvanic releases. And you can also see this red part attached to the camera. So that's a recycled buoy and a antenna poking out of there from a VHF transmitter. And so after about four hours, the galvanic releases corrode and the turtle cam detaches from the turtle and with the help of the boy then comes to the surface and the transmitter then pings a signal, which we were able to receive with our telemetry equipment and then we can retrieve the camera. And with the help of these turtle cams, we are able to get about four hours of point of view footage of a sea turtle and essentially get a glimpse into a sea turtle's life. So here is some footage from the turtle cam. And with the help of this, we can actually investigate, for example, habitat use. So what do the turtles do in the different habitats? How much time do they spend there? What seems to be really vital habitat types and structures that, that they need? Um, on top of that, we can investigate how they interact with other animals as well as conspecific, so other turtles. And um, Additionally, we are able to investigate a stress response to the handling and processing as well as the attachment of the animal born cameras such as turtle cams themselves. Um, on top of that, we were using drones to assess their value for uh, behavioral and node abundance um, assessments and also see how the turtles reacted to boats and investigate the potential effect of or the potential um, negative effects of turtle cams or animal born cameras on the turtles swimming behavior or um, movement speed. But today I want to focus on the snake research project that I developed on Eleuthera. And when I say I developed, I have to acknowledge all the amazing people that gave uh, advice and input during, um, during the time. So CEI or the Cape Luther Institute is a marine and marine species focused research institute that are involved in a multitude of incredibly fascinating marine research programs. 
So that means they don't focus on terrestrial fauna all that much. And with my background being more towards terrestrial herpetofauna, I thought it would be a great idea to investigate the reptiles and amphibians found on land. So you might be wondering, what do we have on Arifra? We've got three frogs. So we've got the Cuban tree frog, the Bohemian flat-headed frog, and the Cuban flat-headed frog. We've got one terrapin or turtle, the Jamaican slider. We've got a couple of lizards, the Cuban twig and all, bark and all, brown and all, Bohemian green and all, the tropical house gecko, Haitian big scale gecolid, three banded gecolid, reef gecko, as well as the American war gecko, curly tail lizard, and orbis amoeba. In terms of snakes, we have four species. The largest one, which is the Bahamas boa, the Bohemian racer, the earthworm blind snake, and the thunder snake. And these thunder snakes, they're truly unique species. They uh, display what is called cephalic autohemorrhaging or the deliberate ejection of blood from the head. And we were for the first time able to record this on video and also describe the process in more detail in our not, uh, short note published in the Herpetological Bulletin earlier this year. Here's the video of the cephalic autohemorrhaging and I just want to emphasize that the pressure applied was absolutely minimal. But just pay attention to how quickly the ice fully flood up flood with blood and how quickly, rapidly they clear up again. It's truly uh, spectacular. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, please have a look at our natural history note here in the bottom right. So the species on Eleuthera face a multitude of threats, including habitat loss, introduced species such as cats, dogs, rats, raccoons, and green iguanas. There's a strong human persecution. Uh, we've got, you've got, you can see here is a Bahamas boa on the right with the severed head found a few meters away from the actual snake. And on top of that, there's world mortality. And so this is what I was encountering essentially on a daily basis on my way to the Institute. So coming across dead snakes on Eleuthera is a very common occurrence. And this was the basis for the snake research project. We don't really know a whole lot about snakes on Eleuthera and across the Bahamas, really, and certainly not much on their mortality. And so I thought it, it would be a good idea to collect all of these dead snakes and record various data, such as um, the date for seasonality, the location to potentially identify hotspots along certain habitat types, and then brought these snakes back to the Institute where they were processed and dissected for further analyses. So essentially created this survey route um, on a 10 kilometer stretch along the Queens Highway, which you can see here in red, it, which was between the Cape Luther Institute and the closest human settlement, which is Deep Creek. This stretch of road is the only one that is collecting, connecting the Cape Luther Institute, as well as the marina, which is here in this top uh, end of the Cape in gray with the rest of um, Eleuthera. And especially the marina is, has multiple hotels. They have a restaurant as well as many boats. So there's quite a lot of tourists and staff that travel to and from the marina on a daily basis. So that means that this stretch of road gets a lot of traffic. You can also see that the survey route stretches across multiple different habitat types. And so over the course of 211 days, we conducted daily surveys along this, um, this red survey route, which amounted to 460 routine surveys and collected all of the dead snakes that we would come across as well as recorded uh, all the live snakes that we would encounter. Additionally, we also picked up all the roadkill that we would find during opportunistic expeditions across Eleuthera. With the help of this, these dead snakes, we were able to and are able to investigate population dynamics, uh, road mortality, diet, parasite prevalence, reproductive morphology, and various other aspects of the snake's biology. And here are some of the results. And I just want to point out that these are mainly preliminary results. 
So over the course of these 211 days, we found um, 68 live snakes as well as 277 dead snakes. And that is together with opportunistic collections. And here on the right, you can see that the majority of those snakes were bohemian races with um, a decent amount of Bahamas boas, a few thunder snakes, and only two blind snakes. So out of these 277 dead snakes, 115 were found on the survey stretch alone, which means that we found more than one dead snake every two days. And so in terms of where we are finding these snakes, you can see here is um, a picture of the, an image of the survey route again, with the yellow dots representing the dead snakes and the purple circles, the live snakes. And you can see that the snakes were heavily associated with the dry coppice forest habitats or the um, bushland. And the majority of dead snakes were found here in the middle where the forest habitat was on both sides of, of the road. Overall, we found more males than females, which you can see here on the right with that blue bar. Uh, but we also found a quite a large number of individuals that we couldn't identify the sex for represented here in gray because they were simply too damaged and therefore they were also damaged too damaged for further analyses and this is actually the limiting factor for most of the roadkill studies is just what condition the snakes or the animals in that case are in and so we had a very in survey effort with our routine daily surveys as well as our opportunistic collections and we were wondering if the survey effort affected the suitability of snakes so did we find more snakes that were suitable when during our routine surveys compared to the opportunistic collections and that was certainly the case we found significantly more snakes that were intact and suitable for further analyses during routine surveys compared to opportunistic ones and you can see that here by comparing the right or the, the yellow proportion of the right bar, the routine bar, with the opportunistic bar for either sex. But what you also notice is that females were significantly more suitable than males. So the two left bars here, the yellow proportion is a lot higher than for the two right bars. And that's interesting because morphologically they're identical. And so it is possible that maybe they have different activity patterns. So the males could be active earlier during the day and are therefore more likely to cross roads as a result and maybe collide with a car and are therefore longer exposed to other detrimental environmental factors such as other cars or weather conditions and end up in a worse state than the females. When we were investigating their diet, we found that about three quarters of all Bahamas boas as well as bohemian races did not contain any food items. For the bohemian races, we found that they relied heavily on lizards, particularly of the Enola species, um, which made up about 83% of their diet. We also found a few snakes, bone fragments that we couldn't identify and an egg. And for the Bahamas boas, we found that the juveniles were feeding on lizards and the adults were feeding on rats, um, suggesting a ontogenetic shift in prey type preference so that essentially that smaller snakes would, or as the snakes grew larger, they would select larger prey. So we knew that bohemian races were feeding on snakes before, but we only knew that they were cannibalistic, so they were feeding on other races. What we didn't know is that they also fed on other snake species. And so we recorded two new prey items, which you can see here in A and B, A being a thunder snake and B a, an earthworm blind snake, um, essentially reporting on these two species as prey items for the first time. In C, you can see a spherodactylus gecko and D is a tropical house gecko. E is one of the Bahamas boas prey items, so that's a rat's tail and a rat's paw. And F is an egg that was found in one of the Bahamas, the Bahamian races, reporting on all phagy for the first time in these snakes. So overall, even though Bahamian races seem to rely heavily on lizards for prey, they seem to be highly opportunistic generalists that will most likely make use of any feeding opportunity that they, that they can. 
And so when we were investigating the diet, we were also looking into the endoparasite prevalence. So how many parasites or how many snakes were infected with endoparasites and how many were present in each snake. And so we found that none of the Bahamas boas had any endoparasites present and about three quarters of all bohemian bases were infected with endoparasites with the majority having less than 30 individual parasites. And I think it was about 16 individuals that had more than 30. And so it's interesting, you can see here's a almost identical proportion of bohemian races that were containing or they were infected with endoparasites and didn't contain any food items. And so we're wondering if there was a correlation between that. Is it possible that the presence of endoparasite somehow affected the race's ability or motivation to capture prey? And in 2012, Lemos et al. were investigating these yellow-necked mice, and they found that mice that were infected with parasites had lower appetite. And so we're wondering if that is the case with our races as well. However, we did not find any correlation between the presence and absence of parasites and the presence and absence of prey. So you can see here the yellow and the purple um, proportion are identical for the presence and absence of endoparasites on the left and the right. And instead they were found in sort of random combination. However, when we were looking at just the empty stomachs, we found that the number of empty stomachs with endoparasites present was about three times as high as the ones with endoparasites absent. And so it is possible that the endoparasites that were found in combination with the prey were actually not there before the prey was consumed and instead introduced to that very same prey item. And so the stomachs that were empty were actually the result of the presence of endoparasites. But in order to make any causal connections, we would have to experimentally um, introduce endoparasites into the snakes and then observe their ability and motivation to capture prey. You can see here is a, a stomach of a bohemian racer with endoparasites present and that is certainly more than 30 individuals. And so the next step for us is to identify the species of the endoparasites to describe these for the first time in a bohemian snake. In addition, we fixed and preserved the male reproductive organs, also called hemipenes. And you can see here are the hemi inter inverted hemipenes of a Bahamas boa on the right. And the hemipenes come in a incredible diversity of shapes and sizes and equipped with ornamental structures. And they can even vary across populations of the same species. And that's really interesting because the hemipenes of the males and the counterpart of the female have been known to work in a sort of lock and key fashion where they perfectly fit into each other. And so if there's variation in the morphology of hemipenes, some males might not be able to mate with some of the females and thus you can create reproductive isolation and with that create different species. And so here are the hemipenes of our, of our snakes. So there's a Bahamas boa on the top and a bohemian races on the bottom. And you can see how vastly they differ. The Bahamas boa's hemipenes has these flounces across the entire length and is heavily bifurcated and generally fairly slender. Whereas the Baham bohemian races has these spines on the lower end and a slight bifurcation at the top and is um, generally a bit broader. We preserved 99 pairs of hemipenes across three species and hope to be able to compare and uh, yeah, to, to process and compare these across the different populations on Eleuthera to get an idea of potential, potentially reproductive isolation between those and um, understand their biogeographic distribution and phylogenetic relationships, not only on Eleuthera, but across the Bahamas. We also investigated sexual dimorphism in the Bahamas boas by looking at their pelvic spurs, which you can see here on the right. And these are essentially vestigial remnants of legs from a lizard ancestor. And they're still connected via pelvic bones and they show surprising mobility. 
So snakes that possess pelvic spurs have been known to use them in copulation where males hold onto females uh, while, ma while, ma while mating and they're also known to use them in male to male combat where the males would tie each other with the pelvic spurs. So it is plausible that these pelvic spurs could underlie select selective pressure to grow larger and more curved in males. And here you can see the pelvic spurs of a female in A and C and pelvic spurs of a male in B and D on the right. And just by looking at that, you can already see that the male's pelvic spurs are a lot larger and more curved than the females. And here is a graph showing the spur length in relation to the body length, so the snout vent length for males in teal and females in red. And you can see that the spur length for males is significantly larger, about twice the size, compared to the females of the same body size. And so this allows for a very simple external assessment of sex. We can just look at the pelvic spurs and tell if it's a male or a female without the need of inserting a probe or physically averting the hemipenes. We also collected tissue samples from all of the dead snakes that we found and together with the preserved specimens as well as the reproductive male reproductive organs, we will be able to improve our understanding of the phylogenetic relationships and biogeographic distribution of these species across the Bahamas. The large number of roadkill is certainly alarming, but we would have to further look into how exactly this high mortality impacts the populations. The roadkill data really allowed us to investigate and answer various important ecological and morphological questions, and also provided us with one of the largest collections of male reproductive organs available. The next step for us is to investigate the abundance of the different snakes on Eleuthera to, so essentially finding out how many there actually are in order to understand the impact of the high road mortality on these snakes on the island. We also want to collect roadkill information from other islands to compare to Eleuthera's and get a better understanding of how the road mortality impacts uh, these species, the, 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 the snakes on the species level. In addition to that, we would like to collect the reproductive organs, uh, male reproductive organs from other islands to compare to Lutras and um, get a better understanding of the um, phylogenetic relationships and the biogeographic distribution. Now I just want to talk about a few smaller side projects that we were working on. One was this roadkill scavenger project where we wanted to understand what takes the snakes off the road. So how do they disappear and how long do they stay on the road for? And that was really important for us to understand if we're actually collecting most of the dead snakes that are being run over or if they would disappear even before we get the chance to come across them and are thus underestimating the number of dead snakes on the road. And so for that, we used snakes that we already dissected and processed and placed them back out on the road. You can see them here in these red circles and use different habitat types and different sizes of snakes. And then installed these camera traps on uh, trees or any kind of structure close by. And over the course of five months, we installed 72 cameras that were recorded for 48 hours each, after which we collected those snakes again. So we found that the snake stayed on the road for an average of 32 hours, which is great because that would mean that we likely collect most of the snakes that are being run over um, with our daily surveys. And actually 50% of the snakes that we put out didn't disappear off the road within the 48 hours. We didn't find any effect of size or habitat on the likelihood of disappearing off the road or how long they stayed on the road for. But we did find a few curious customers. So here is a cat. We had a few cats that were feeding on the dead snakes. We also found um, some night herons that were picking those snakes up. 
and also a fair few dogs, but they actually never scavenged on the snakes. They just thoroughly investigated them similar to what is happening here, and then they just moved on. We also found a crab that pulled one of the snakes into its burrow. And another side project that we're working on was the use of APHIS, or the Automated Photo Identification Suit, to provide an alternative method to distinguish between individual snakes without the need of more intrusive or invasive methods such as cautery or scale clipping. And here are two photos of two different individuals of Bohemian races, and you can see how vastly they differ in their coloration and scalation particularly in the labial region. And so we're taking photos of these snakes and then feeding it into the software uh, where we had then had to mark distinctive spots. So in this case, we were using the corners of the scales. And afterwards, APHIS would use um, these points to compare the relative distances between the photos to distinguish between individuals. And this is done in a fully automated fashion. However, the marking of the points themselves can be quite labor intensive, depending on what animal you're working with. You might have to mark quite a lot of points. And then if you have a large data set, that can, be quite, can become quite a large task. So we were marking about 35 to 45 different spots on the snake's faces. And you can see here in paint red, <laughs> you can see some of the points that we marked. And then once you've marked all of the different individuals, APHIS creates a score, essentially, um, which you can see here in these red circles on the right side. And on the top, we have two different individuals and at the bottom, the same. And you can see that the score for the same individual is really, really low, which means essentially means that there's a low variation between the relative distances across the photos. And that means the lower the score, the more likely it is to be the same individual. We were using APHIS on, or are currently using APHIS on about 60 individual snakes across uh, two species. And it seems to be doing a fantastic job in matching recaptures and deeming them the same individual. Here are some of the examples you can see, even when you are using photos that are vastly different, different in their lighting as well as the resolution or maybe even upside down, APHIS is still able to determine them the same individual and suggest them as the first um, first suggest the first candidate. The next thing for us is trying to um, automate the or for APHIS is trying to automate the marking process itself um, so that you don't have to put the spots manually in anymore but just take a photo of the desired region and APHIS will recognize the points of interest automatically and apply them and then compare between the photos all automatically. In addition, we want to use phone quality images in order to eventually develop an application that you can just have on your phone where you go in the field, you take a photo and APHIS will tell you if it's the same, if it's a recapture or not, and if it is, which one. And the last little side project I want to talk about is uh, coordinated bat hunting, which had been reported in Cuban and Puerto Rican boas, where these snakes place themselves on the entrance of a bat caves in a way that maximizes their chances of catching a bat each. So they do this in a sort of coordinated fashion where they would come out at a certain time of the day. Um, and we were wondering, because we have some bat caves on the island, we are wondering if our Bahamas boas hunt together as well. So we went to one of the bat caves and we did find a Bahamas boa perched just above the entrance of the cave. And so we went inside and we found that there was a pretty decent number of bats. And so we decided to install a camera trap. And here's the view of the camera trap. You can see some of the bats emerging um, from the cave down at the bottom. And so we left this camera trap there for two weeks. And sure enough, we did find a Bahamas boa here indicated with the red arrow on a branch close to the cave. However, we did not observe this boa hunting any bats and neither did we find multiple boas in any of our camera trap images. And that could have several reasons. It could be that the bat density is simply too low 
or maybe it was the wrong time of the year, or maybe this specific cave was just not ideal. However, boas in the Bahamas have been reported to feed on bats, so it'd be interesting to follow up on this at some stage. And lastly, I want to talk about our conservation efforts. On top of all the snake research that we were conducting, we also put a lot of focus on human snake conflict mitigation. And I brought up this image again here of the Bahamas boa with the severed head, just to emphasize how that there's unfortunately a stronger version of a stronger version towards snakes in the Bahamas, which is a direct result of the misconception that these snakes are dangerous and um, non-essential. And this is actually great because there's literally no other reason to persecute these snakes other than not knowing how harmless and important they are. And so we set out to clear up those misconceptions and organize talks and presentations as well as snake education events with our many international guests as well as within the local communities. CEI works closely with the local primary and middle schools and we regularly uh, welcome students to the Institute to learn about our research as well as conservation issues and how to tackle them. And so we had the kids join a couple of snake dissections which they were surprisingly enthusiastic about and also interact with snakes during and after presentations. And so creating these positive experiences with snakes is vital, especially with younger crowds, in order to remove this taut discomfort around snakes and instead evoke a sense of fascination and the much needed respect that for these magnificent animals. We already had great success in changing people's attitudes and a lot of people now call us to rescue a snake from their property rather than killing it themselves, which is brilliant. And currently we are working on raising funds for the creation of a permanent snake education facility on the property in order to increase our conservation impact through education and reach a larger number of people to promote peaceful coexistence with snakes on Eruthra and across the Bahamas. And I want to end my talk by acknowledging all the truly amazing people that have been involved in the snake research and conservation efforts. They often had to sit next to me while I loaded the car with bags of roadkill snakes or reach into my freezer only to bump into a stored dead snake. And I really appreciate their tolerance and patience. Without these people, the snake project would have never worked out the same. And I'm truly grateful to have them on the snake team. And lastly, if you have any idea, ideas or any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me either by email or you can find me on social media here. And if you want to learn more about the project or about myself, you can check out my personal website. And with that, I thank you all for listening.